referred to the case of Akbar, which I was going to take you to next, which is behind tab 49 in bundle 2. see what the case was about from paragraph 3. And the nature of the claim made, including relevantly in paragraph 5, Roman 1. And the case was analysed principally under article 5, but also had an article 8 and 14 element to it. Um, and the, for our purpose, I think the four questions that my Lord President had in mind are at 53. I suspect you've had in mind, yes. and then you see the title above paragraph 57, article 14, and bit. Yes. But there's quite a long section of the judgment um, analysing the various cases and so on in relation to that, running all the way up to paragraph 78. And it basically breaks <coughs> down into an analysis of articles 5 and 14, and then from paragraph 73 to 77, article 8 and 14. Um, but the key analysis, perhaps, is at uh, 68 to 70. And perhaps more relevant to 69 and 70. Can I just invite you to read, read 69 and 70? Then a debate between, if I've understood the reasoning and the judgment, claim, there was then a debate between whether or not you looked at the core of the right or whether you looked at the core of the value which underpinned the right, and that's the subject of some treatment in the in the later paragraphs. But uh, uh, we're all accepting, certainly on this side, that the usual approach is the general, broad, and generous one to ambit. See paragraph 72, Roman 1, uh, drawing on uh, the well known passage from Sir Nicholas Bratz's judgment in. Uh, Adami, in Adami and Malta, saying doesn't matter if you're outside the scope of the article, it almost follows that you are, as it were. And then the reference to core values, the Secretary of State there relied on uh, the referencing cliff to core values. The court decides that that case involved a positive modality, uh, transfer to open conditions and so on, as we see from the tail end under the quote of paragraph Roman 2 within paragraph 72. And then there was a concern that if you focus in Roman 3, that if you focus too hard on the relevant substantive uh, convention right as opposed to the core value underpinning the right, that, that isn't the right approach. and some uh, consideration of various other judgments, including my Lord Lord Justice Davis's judgment in Ryder, in Romans 6. And then the conclusion which is reached in that positive modality case, principally in Roman 8, 
just before paragraph 73. So that's the conclusion in relation to Article 5. The conclusion in relation to Article 5 is that it's a positive modality type case. The relevant measures in question uh, might have fed into the possibility of the person being released after their tariff had ended, even though they had no rights under Article 5 prior to that point, technically. Uh, and in those circumstances, there was a more than a tenuous connection between that interest and the core values protected by Article 5, namely the protection from arbitrary unjustified interference with liberty. So that's the reasoning under 72, if I've understood it correctly, and a different conclusion would have been reached, if necessary, in relation to Article 8. And the reasoning of the court in relation to that uh, it, it is principally uh, to be derived from paragraphs 75, 76 and 77, if I could just invite you to cast an eye down those paragraphs. Now I'll make some submissions on the case. I should say, when I said earlier, I reminded the court that someone had said, and my lord had said in Akbar, there are limits. That's the second sentence of paragraph 75. Oh, and that's a reference to Article 8, not Article 14. Yes. Yes. But what you're doing, if I've understood it correctly in this judgment, what you're doing is to analyse uh, the core or essence of the values under Article 8, and for that purpose you're determining its reach. And as we all know, it provides for respect for family life, and it's a qualified article and so on. So you're analysing that bit of it for the purpose of seeing whether this measure could be said to fall within the ambit of Article 8 for the purpose of Article 14. So what, what, what proposition are you deriving from this authority? Well, my lord, it's obviously, on, it's obviously on its own facts, but we do respectfully submit in particular paragraphs 68, 69 and 70 are helpful because they draw the distinction, which we were discussing before the short adjournment, between those cases involving a positive modality, if you will, where the state provides a, a, a benefit or right, like a bereavement allowance, for example, and there where all you need to show is that there's more than a tenuous connection with the core values protected by the right in question. And the negative cases arising in the context of an infringement or an impairment of the relevant negative obligation in the article, where you also need to show an adverse impact. But in none of them, in none of this analysis, is there the sort of negative modality case that we are dealing with here. But doesn't this authority uh, lend, in its treatment of Article 5, lend some support to the proposition that by impacting upon the prospect of getting a home, you are impacting upon the right to family or private life. My Lord, we respectfully submit not. There are limits under Article 8. Uh, ultimately, we make the two submissions I made before the short adjournment, one of which is that, and this case is, uh, uh, it indicates that, that the analysis is this way, none of the Strasbourg case law has, um, as the learned judge found in our case below, recognised a negative modality case, if I can put it that way. And so there's our primary submission is that you don't even get into the territory. But secondly, if you do, and if it is possible to expand the ambit in that way, there is then a question about what principles should apply to control that expansion. And we respectfully submit in relation to that that at the very least what would be required in that sort of case as opposed to in a positive modality case is something which indicates 
by reference to the causal links between the legislation and the discrimination first, and secondly, the true extent of any impact, that you are actually touching that core value? I'm not, I'm not sure that this case um, gets us very far in terms of the facts of, of, of this case. This, this was a positive modality case. It was. Uh, this suggests that there may be something outside positive modality. Whatever it said about anything outside positive modality must be obiter, because this was a positive modality case. But, yes. Um, and it said it, it suggests that it, it, if, if there is something outside, then there should be some limit. But that's about as far as it goes. I, I don't take it much further than that. Um, but, but, but we do respectfully submit that it's helpful to see the analysis going through Article 5 with its emphasis on looking at the core value underpinning the right rather than necessarily the right, and to see the way the court approached Article 8. Yes. Yeah by saying effectively, just because you can say that something is, has some form of impact on family or private life, as it plainly did in that case as well. It's not enough. It's not enough. Yeah. He was going to be released earlier. If that was enough, that would have been enough there. But actually, it's a tighter analysis than that. Uh, true it is, I totally agree, that if you're in the territory where you can have a ne negative modality case at all, you've got to then design the principles. And as I say, my submissions are not that, as I made, made the submission before the short adjournment, if you're going to do that, the only real candidates drawing on the sort of thinking that appears in this judgment is to say, well, you do it by reference to the causal link between the true causal link between the legislation and the, and the discrimination, if it's occurring, uh, and you do it by reference, presumably, also to the true extent to which people are actually affected. And so far as that is concerned, I'll come to the facts in a moment, but it is worth re-emphasising that this case is not about where those who have no right to live in the UK are going to live. This case involves an allegation of dis discrimination not against that category. The legislation is accepted as valid in relation to that category, but uh, as involving incidental and accidental discrimination against those with leave to remain or leave to enter. And that is important to bear in mind when you come to start considering the evidence, because in relation to those people, um, uh, uh, well, I made my submissions about the evidence earlier on, so yeah. got, but it's, it's got to be about around those sort of principles which seem to chime with, um, uh, with, with that case. So my submission is that you need a, in a negative modality case, if it can work at all, you would need some form of pretty serious and widespread impact and interference with core values, if you will. It isn't the same as a positive modality case in that respect where you need no more than a tenuous connection or something more than a tenuous connection. I think if you're negative modality and you're going to allow that to run, it requires something stricter because otherwise you're not going to get in, in the territory of establishing any form of causal link really sensibly between the legislation and the discrimination. And, and it is therefore worth bearing in mind what the Strasbourg case law does and doesn't cover in relation to uh, uh, um, housing and matters to do with housing. We know that it doesn't cover a right to a home, Petrovich. Uh, but there were two other cases I wanted to, to show you just on that subject. The first of them was the M case in bundle one. You might <coughs> keep bundle two to hand because I'm going to go to a case in that next. But bundle one, tab 12. <coughs> M and the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions. And the relevant paragraph for all, but for this purpose is 83. This is M. Uh, uh, I normally know this is RJM, but this is M. I think this is the Lord Walker judgment with the concentric circles in it, about Article 8. Um, but paragraph 83, for present purposes, gives you some idea of the, or, or some help in relation to the Article 8 analysis. <coughs> in particular, focusing on the notion of respect, as you see in the second sentence of that. And then looking at examples of cases which do fall within that notion of failure to accord respect. The serious cases that are given, Dudgeon, well-known, Lustig, Preen, Gays in the Armed Forces and so on, 
uh, city brass banning from all forms of employment. And then the final sentence, less serious interference would not merely have been a, uh, not merely have been a breach of Article 8, would not have fallen within the ambit of Article 8 at all. So degree well, I think when he says ambit there, I think he's meaning engaged, isn't he? Uh, my Lord, I think... I is, think he, is, he, is, he, is he intending to talk in the language about Article 14? Well, I think he is, because it's he all is. in the context of Article 14, as you see from the previous paragraphs. I think in the first part of the last sentence, there's a, there's a not missing, isn't there? I think there it is. Should, it should be a double Would not really not have been a breach of yeah. Article 8. <laughs> yeah. But you see, you see the essential point, yes. a degree of seriousness required, and if, you're, if you don't hit that, and, and the degree of seriousness required flows in part from the notion that Article 8 is a, is a right based upon respect. And, and then moving more directly to the housing, you, you, you have Petrovich, I won't go back to that, but if you go back to Bundle 2, if you would, and go to tab 35, the H case, which I think my old Justice Davis was one of the members, and 101 is the relevant paragraph for our purposes on page 568, sorry, jump around. So bundle 2, tab 35. Two thirty five para 101 on page 568 in the judgment of the Master of the Rolls. There was obviously a debate in that case around the, the particular scheme that was the MTPS. None of the authorities support the claimant's case. The MTPS falls within the ambit of Article 8 in conjunction with 14. MTPS is concerned with the transfer of a secure tenant who is already housed pursuant to Ealing's duties under Part 7 from one council property to another. I can't see this as anything to do with the core value which Article 8 is intended to protect. Now, again, that's not dispositive in this case, but it indicates that there are limits. And that when you're dealing with something less than homelessness, you need to think pretty hard about whether it even falls within the ambit. There, of course, the case involved merely a transfer from one home to another, so it's different on one view. Yes, uh, insofar as the Master Earl cited um, Miss Justice Goss in H.A., I think both I and Lord Justice Underhill didn't agree with that. I'm not sure. I don't think my laws disagreed. Did you? On, no, we did. We didn't. On we the did. we, we, no, we didn't. We, no, yeah. we, 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 we agreed in that. But uh, yes. what we said is <laughs> you don't have to have a settled home to be able to enjoy private or family life. Yeah. Which you would say reinforces the patronage point. Quite. But, but as I say, I come back to it before coming briefly to the facts. I come, I come back to it. That the, the idea that if you're going to say negative modality works in the sense of there being legislation which causes this incidental effect, uh, effect, the twin tests could only be causal link between legislation and discrimination and true extent of impact. Uh, and I've made lots of submissions about those already, uh, just very, very briefly. H here, as I say, you've got... Um, a scheme in which the discrimination is no part of the legislation, on the contrary, it's positively prohibited. So it is at most an incidental and an unintended effect. Secondly, it is uh, 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 doubtful whether there is indeed any effect. See the submissions I made earlier on the evidence. A any truly established differential effect at all, and therefore any discrimination at all. But even if there is... It is, at the very best, doubtful and small, if I can put it that way. <coughs> and we are not, as I emphasised earlier, here dealing with where is someone going to live, they've got no right to remain. We're dealing with right to remain people. We're not dealing with homelessness. Uh, even if one takes all the best evidence that the claimants could produce at its height, you still end up with a position where someone might have to reapply but they're reapplying from a base where they don't have to leave the country, they've got a right to remain here. 
uh, and so it's simply about a, a, a short delay, if any, at its very height. And so we, we, we do respectfully submit that in, in those circumstances, unless you are going to say that the mere fact that there is legislation, of which there will be many examples, I suspect, across the statute, but unless you're going to say that the mere fact that the legislation exists in the sphere of housing and creates a, an economic incentive or something of that kind on landlords, and that's enough to bring you within the ambit, then that first aspect of my test, the causal link between the legislation and the, um, and, and the discrimination, is simply not made out. So for those specific reasons, our alternative case, beyond saying it's positive modality or bust, uh, our alternative case is to say if you get into that, you're then going to have to redesign or design from first base some principles that should apply to constrain the negative modality. If you do that, it's on those twin bases and our facts, if you apply them to those twin bases, that link between legislation and discrimination and true extent of impact, our facts don't bring you close enough to the core value or the core values that underpin Article 8. And we do submit that you derive some assistance, at least, from uh, from the M case and that Lord Bingham analysis, or the, that Lord Walker analysis in the, in the M case. So that's what we say about ambit. I was going to make earlier on some submissions about uh, the case law um, in Strasbourg particularly, but also the Roma rights case law that my Lord uh, asked me to deal with. Um, uh, but, but, and this analysis could be put on an, under, under a number of different heads in these submissions, but, but it, it probably goes to do mo no little more than to emphasise uh, that the Strasbourg case law uh, does not, as the judge found, endorse any idea of negative mod modality in the sense that we've been using that uh, that concept, uh, and uh, has only as it were, just got to indirect discrimination in DH, uh, and, and hasn't gone beyond that. And all the cases that Malone and Friend relies on are either different or entirely explicable on traditional discrimination analysis grounds. So, to, so to start with the DH case. That's the one I started off making submissions about uh, before. Um, but, but the short point in relation to that, for your notice, uh, authorities four, uh, 3, tab 63, and it's dealt with in our skeleton at paragraph 15.1 and our supplemental skeleton at paragraph 4. But the points we there make are that uh, at best it's, it involved rank indifference by the Czech government to the education system in relation to exams which it uh, had the carriage of, as it were, uh, which led to de facto segregation of Roma children in schools that were um, uh, uh, unsuitable, it might be thought, for uh, those children. Uh, 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 but, uh, so that's um, uh, uh, the facts of DH therefore support the proposition that this is direct state involvement in the discriminatory scheme. It's either, well, it certainly it, it has carriage of and has designed the education system with the splitting of the schools, but it also has involved in the design and reliance upon tests for children, which led to that de facto uh, discriminatory position in relation to Roma children. And one sees that perhaps most clearly, I don't invite you to look at it now, but Paris 40 and 200 on the facts. And that, that this, this case is a case of either indirect or direct discrimination is, uh, was the subject of consideration and a finding by Lord Justice Elias in the AM Somalia case. If you just go back to bundle one of the authorities and go to tab 17, if you would. for this purpose, sorry if you jump around, tab 17, I want paragraphs 39 and 40.
is that that's a helpful analysis and a correct analysis of DH with its recent recognition even of the concept of indirect discrimination, which as you know is the, the, the neutral criteria which applies more to one protected group than another. But also his analysis of what DH was actually about. Was it an indirect discrimina discrimination case or a direct discrimination case? Well, it was, he tended to think, and we respectfully agree, more like a direct discrimination case than anything. But for present purposes, that doesn't matter terribly. What's, what's important is that there's, it, it, it is not negative modality. There's nothing in DH or Lord Justice Elias's accurate analysis of it to support the principle that any regime, any legislative regime carrying any risk of discrimination by a private individual is the responsibility of the state through discrimination law. There are recognised categories of discrimination and DH falls squarely within them, albeit that it was at the time something of a move by the Strasbourg court towards indirect discrimination recognition. And that paragraph 40 also provides the answer to any form of reliance on uh, the Roma rights case, uh, uh, um, at which we deal with in our supplemental skeleton at paragraph 7, and is in authorities bundle 1, same one, tab 10. Um, if you could just flick back to that. But the answer in a nutshell is that Roma rights involve direct discrimination. It involved the conduct of state officials, not private individuals, using and being effectively authorised to use stereotypical assumptions about a particular ethnic group, Roma, pursuant to an express position allowing the targeting of Roma in a specific operation aimed at them. So you were effectively advising state officials to carry out direct race discrimination. And that was the analysis of Lord Justice Elias, as we've seen. And that is obviously the position. See, for that purpose, paragraph 35 <coughs> in the judgment or in the speech sorry, of Lord Stain. And we note in parenthesis that even in that context, and even with direct discrimination of that kind, it appears that if there had been careful instructions to treat all passengers the same way, that would have led to a different result. See paragraph 89 in the speech of Lord Hope. But so Roma rights doesn't provide any support for the proposition that any regime carrying any risk of discrimination by a private individual is the responsibility of the state through discrimination. Costello Roberts. Um, I, I don't think you need to turn up, it'll, it'll be well familiar. That was um, beating of children in schools. We've dealt with it in our supplemental skeleton of paragraph 6. It's in bundle 3 at tab 53 if you want it. But it's simply, it's simply illustrative of a totally different proposition, which is that there are positive obligations on the state in certain situations to take action there to pass legislation to prevent Article 3 ill treatment by a private individual. So it's just an example of absolutely, <coughs> absolutely standard uh, positive obligations on the state, i.e. obligations on the state to intervene to protect one private citizen from acting contrary to the convention rights of another one. And the state sometimes has to say, you can't do that. So there it had to say, we're going to legislate to outlaw or ban beating in schools, and the private schools are. Um, at Greslac, which is the final one we've dealt with in our supplemental skeleton, paragraph 8. It's in bundle 3 of the authorities at tab 68. Again, I don't invite you to turn it up. But that involved a correct application of the relevant local legislation. Uh, and it wasn't about discrimination by a private individual contrary to legislation. So our primary case is that there is no ECHR case in which the state is held responsible under discrimination analysis for anything other than direct or indirect 
discrimination as a result of a state legislation or system. Alternatively, even if you can get into the perhaps inaptic or negative mentality <coughs> sphere, you've still got to be able to point to some positive failure by the state in the face of substantial discrimination that can properly be said to be caused by the legislative scheme. And here on the facts, that isn't possible. So fully recognising the height of the hurdle that I would normally <coughs> have to overcome to get outside the ambit, but we do respectfully submit that this is one of those cases. So that's ambit. Uh, justification, I was going to move to next, if that would be convenient, unless there are any other questions on ambit. Yes. The uh, test and the principled approach in relation to justification is, we submit, clear and well established, and it involves a uh, 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 put at its lowest, considerable respect for the judgments made by Parliament in primary legislation and indeed in uh, other species of legislation, but particularly in primary legislation. And the test which reflects the degree of respect that is accorded to those judgments is the manifestly without reasonable foundation test. And there have been a significant number of recent Supreme Court cases on that subject, uh, which I'm sure will be quite familiar to the court, so I can take them quickly if I may. Uh, MA is in bundle 2 of the authorities at tab 31. This was the bedroom the bedroom tax case. And the relevant reasoning <coughs> and analysis is in the uh, majority judgment given by Lord Toulson. Uh, it starts above paragraph 28 on page 4562 under the title, Did the Courts Apply the Right Test? Because Lord Dyson below in the Court of Appeals had applied the Manifested Without Reasonable Foundation Test. And uh, Lord Toulson uh, quotes the well-known passage from uh, the Baroness's judgment in Humphreys. He does that in paragraph 29 over on page 4563. And can I just invite you to sideline from that quotation from Humphreys the final sentence in paragraph 16 of the quote, because of their direct knowledge of the society and its needs, national authorities are in principle better placed, and so on. Then the reference to the phrase manifestly will be found at the end of that paragraph and in paragraph 17. And then the same test is applied, see paragraph 18, the same test is applied by uh, the court in RJM, which I think we just looked at denial of income support and so on to rough sleepers. And then in 19, uh, particularly the passage just above the letter F on page 4564, it seems clear from Steck, however, that the normally strict test for justification of sex discrimination and the enjoyment of convention rights gives way to the manifestly reason foundation test in the context of state benefits. The same principles are applied to the sex discrimination involved in denying widows, pensions, runky, and so on. Uh, so that's the quotation from Baroness Hale uh, in Humphreys, with which ultimately, see power of 38 of Lord Toulson's judgment, he agrees. But just before we get there, if you go down, still on page 4564 to paragraph 30, you'll see from the last three or four lines that Lord Dyson applies the manifestly without reasonable foundation test. And then, importantly, for the principle of the thing, paragraph 32, the court explains why it is that the manifestly without reasonable foundation test is as it is. And then they affirm it in um, 
uh, 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 in paragraph uh, 38. And uh, the next one is DA, uh, that's in Authorities, Volume 3, Tab 43. So same one, Tab 43. And this is the Benefits Cap case, like the Supreme Court recently. And the relevant paragraphs for present purposes are uh, the passage in the Judgment of Lord Wilson, which starts uh, above paragraph 55 on page 3307. You see issue 7, the test of justification of the title. Uh, and you'll see that he uh, uh, effectively cites from and relies on Lord Reed in uh, G. So if you go over to page 3308, uh, sorry, in the first benefit cap case, so I think that was SG, um, uh, 3308 by the letter B, he's citing from Lord Reed in the first benefit cap case, do you see that? Yep. Uh, and can I invite you to read what Lord Reed said about that? That's all quite important for the justification for the, this being the test. see the echoes with MA immediately. And then back to the judgment of Lord Wilson, power 57, Lord Reed, then completed 93 by adding, unless manifested without reasonable foundation, their assessment should be respected. And then there was something of a question about whether all that was right or wrong, or whether it applied to some only some stages of the discriminate of the um, justification analysis. And Lord Wilson holds a bit of ash on himself, as it were, in 58, and then comes to the conclusion in 59 that he now accepts the weight of authority mandates, that being the test, effectively, and then cites Humphreys in paragraph 60. So that's uh, Lord Wilson, sorry, one other passage from Lord Wilson, perhaps the passage in 65, Sorry, that's the ash hurling paragraph. 65, see in particular the final sentence of 65. For by then there was and there still remains clear authority both in Humphreys and in the bedroom tax case. That's the one I took you to earlier, MA, for the proposition that at any rate in relation to governments needs to justify would otherwise be discrimination in effect of a rule governing entitlement to welfare benefits. The sole question is whether it is manifested without reasonable foundation. So that is Lord Wilson, and then Lord Carnworth and uh, Lords Hodge and Hughes are to the same effect. I don't invite you to read them now, but 110 is Lord Carnworth, and Lords Hodge and Hughes are 125. And then two child benefits in two child families, recently in the Court of Appeal main judgment given by Lord Justice Leggett. Uh, that is behind tab 45 in the same bundle. I'll just look very briefly at that. <laughs> I think the key passages from this were cited from memory in, in Akbar. Uh, but they are 87 and 89. Again, exploring why it is that that is the manifesto that reasonable foundation is the test. So could I invite you to just read 80. 87 and 89 on page 5715. Yeah. Well, you can read 87, 88 and 89 perhaps, but it's yes. going to be familiar stuff by now. <coughs>
truth and issue of that passage for good measure and just to complete this, and in a context outside social security where the same effective approach is applied, um, can I refer you to tab 47 in that same bundle, Court of Appeal decision, Lord Justices Lewis and Bean and Baker in Simawi, and the relevant paragraphs for that purpose are 58 and 59. That's the reason why I took you to the passages which explain why it was that that was the ne uh, uh, why the test had been formulated in that way, <coughs> given the uh, democratic judgments and so on that have to be made, made in, in the context of setting up primary legislative schemes of this kind and other kinds, to emphasise that there's no earthly reason why it should be different outside <coughs> social security, and it isn't. There's always a fly in the Strasbourg ointment. And the fly on the Strasbourg ointment this time is in a case called J, D, and A, uh, which I'm not going to spend much time on because it's, well, for a variety of reasons, but it's behind tab 72 in bundle 3 if you want it. It's a recent section judgment in a United Kingdom case in which uh, the section seemed to consider that uh, uh, the broad margin of appreciation uh, would. Uh, only apply in rather more limited circumstances. And the reason I don't spend too long on it is because it may well, uh, we suspect, go to the Grand Chamber. And the authorities that are cited in the section don't, with the greatest respect for the section, uh, chime with the range of case law in which that approach and that test has been applied. But in any event, and more relevantly for your purposes, given the weight of Supreme Court authority that I've just taken you to, I think we're all agreed that this is Kay and Lambeth territory at this level, and that you're bound by the Supreme ah. Court. As well. So I'm not going to spend long on that, but I would like right to draw it to your attention at least for that purpose. So the test is manifestly without reasonable foundation, which is helpful. Uh, the only other point I wanted to draw attention to in relation to the principled approach to how you go about doing the analysis is this. Normally in a discrimination case, as you know, when you're focusing on justification, you focus on the justification for the difference in treatment. Why is it that um, uh, the difference in treatment exists? But that is obviously a problematic analysis in circumstances it, such as in your, in most, if not all, indirect discrimination cases where the legislation is neutral on its face and the indirect discrimination may be unintended. <coughs> so the question then is, well, what's the approach of the court at the justification stage to that? And the answer to that question we submit on, again, on Supreme Court authority of SG which I'll take you to in a second, is that when you're dealing with uh, unintended effects, when you're dealing with indirect discrimination uh, and uh, those sort of effects, the correct approach is to examine the justification for the scheme itself. And that's the approach that you apply to justification. So one sees that if you go back to bundle two, if you would. If you had bundle three out, that can go away. So back to SG, which is tab 25. SG, I should say, that was the first benefit cap case. Do you remember there was a reference to Lord Reed in the first benefit cap case? I think that was to this one. I'll just check. Yeah. That, was, that, that was to this one. <coughs> I think they quoted from paragraphs in the 90s from Lord Reed, but this is the first benefit caps case. For present purposes, for the purpose of the principle I've just given you, it's paragraph 13 in the judgment of Lord Reed. So 
you end up in a direct indirect discrimination case there they give the example of heavy lifting but you end up in an indirect discrimination case looking for the justification for the rule itself so it's the latter part of paragraph 13 having cited uh, dh and then uh, uh, in uh, baroness hale's judgment <coughs> at paragraph 189 making, I hope, the point that I've just tried to explain in more elegant language there. So 189 on page 1505, and the sentence I particularly want is the one between B and C. It's therefore the measure itself which has to be justified, rather than the fact that women are disproportionately affected by it. But it's the same point as, is made by, as was made earlier by Lord Reed. So that's what I want to say on the principled approach to justification. And my submission is that Parliament applying that approach and the MWRF standard, the Manifest Without Reason Foundation standard, Parliament is plainly justified in pursuing the aim it does in the legislation. And indeed, no one in truth really challenges that. This is the set of aims that are designed to support immigration control and all of that targeting, if you will, the legislation on those who do not have leave to remain or leave to enter. <coughs> no one's worrying about those. <coughs> the discrimination which is the subject here of complaint is those who do have leave to remain and do have leave to enter, and the incidental or alleged accidental effect of that. But the legislation itself plainly pursues an important social objective. Uh, 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 that's covered in some detail in Mr. Asmat's statement from paragraphs 38 onwards. <coughs> but as I say, there is really no challenge to the justification for the scheme itself as aiming to ensure that landlords treat those without LTE or LTR differently. Well, that, that would seem to accord with the overall objective of uh, the 2000 Directive. Exactly so, because that would be to target those without one of right. It's not necessary for this purpose, I should emphasise, just in case a point is taken on this, it seemed to be in writing, not necessary to exercise, in that exercise, to evidence the degree of success it has actually had. And that's because it's for Parliament to judge on day one whether it considers this to be a potentially useful measure. And I don't invite you to turn it up now, but Lord Newberger had some interesting things to say about on that subject in BB, the English language uh, testing scheme, uh, authorities uh, 2, tab 26 at paragraph 97, where he referred to the inevitable <coughs> degree of crystal ball gazing involved when bringing in an experimental new scheme and no requirement to engage in artificial uh, uh, cost benefits analyses for that purpose. That was one of the challenges made in that litigation. But in any event, there is, there is evidence that it has been effective. See ASMAT statement, paragraphs 48 to 49. So we're dealing with a position where any difference of treatment is the unintended consequence of a scheme designed to ensure that the public interest in proper immigration controls is effectively met. And the obligation it is not to avoid any risk of discrimination by landlords. That's no part of the correct principled approach and would in any event be to impose an impossible standard that would undermine the proper pursuit of that public interest objective. So even if there is some difference of treatment and even if the evidence does bear out uh, that someone with leave to remain or enter might have to apply, I don't know, to two different landlords, say, which is about the height of it, if they, don't have, if they don't have a British passport, that wouldn't undermine the scheme. It wouldn't touch the justification for the scheme. Our submission is that Parliament's scheme is a properly respectful and protective legislative scheme. It carefully recognised and equally carefully considered the risk of discrimination, of this sort of incidental discrimination, 
and it took active legislative and other steps to avoid it. See ASMAP para 52 and following. So there was intensive consideration by Parliament, dealt with in detail in that witness statement, intensive consideration both by Her Majesty's Government and by Parliament, see particularly para 62 and following, and there was then a careful reaction to try and meet any risk through legislative provision, codes and practical support. We are certainly not in territory in which a state has created a system uh, with a clear risk of substantial discrimination built in with impunity, if you will. Parliament's aware of the risk. It deliberately legislates to provide for practical measures to try to prevent against that risk. And the scheme that has emerged of course has some degree of complexity because the underlying subject matter has some degree of complexity, but it's as simple and as possible to operate as may be. And I've made my uh, 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 submissions about that. Uh, I emphasise in this context and for this purpose that it is simply wrong to suggest that the scheme produces some kind of uh, rational economic response from landlords involving the sort of discrimination which is complained about. And we've discussed that earlier on, so I can take it very quickly. First, landlords must obey the law, and the law is crystal clear and is reinforced by the legislative scheme. The only rational response for the private citizen is to understand the scheme and the law and comply with it. Secondly, and bolstering that, it's a point I made earlier, but I come back to it here. If it's suggested, as it is, that landlords are taking an economically convenient course, but discriminatory course, because of the legislative scheme, you can't, you can't have one thing without the other. If that's what they're doing, and they know of the scheme, there can be no justification for not finding out properly what its requirements are and complying with them. You can't just say I'm motivated to act in this way because I know the scheme exists but I can't be bothered to find out what its requirements are. And thirdly and in any event, the core elements of compliance with the scheme in a non-discriminatory way are not complicated. Specifically acceptable documents are listed, there is plenty of guidance about what reasonable inquiries need to be made, what documents need to be retained in the legislative scheme and reinforced in the codes. The documents that are required either are or should be available to all or the vast majority of those who have LTR and LTE but no British passport. And there is nothing whatever to suggest that there is any incentive, and it's perhaps a reason for being very cautious about some of the landlord surveys, there's nothing to suggest any incentive or indeed any justification for landlords to refuse a tenancy to anyone producing one of the specified documents. Indeed, if they did so and said, well, I'm frightfully sorry, you may say that that's an acceptable document under the scheme and I accept that it's valid and genuine, but I'm going to insist on a British passport, they would be acting in a discriminatory manner. And Section 33 of the 2010 Act would cause them all manner of problems if that were to be what they did. So one needs to be very cautious before... Uh, 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 concluding anything other than, uh, <coughs> than that. Uh, but as I say, the big answer to all of this is that citizens are obliged to comply with the law. Uh, and finally, in relation to justification, I, I'm not going to go through it or go back to it in any detail, so I've dealt with it already. But if it is relevant to consider in this very strange context where you're justifying something which is unintended and positively contrary to the scheme and you're looking... I don't know, to see whether enough has been done to try to prevent it in practical and sensible ways. The nature and the impact of the scheme may be important, so the degree to which people are affected and the nature of that impact, unintended though it is, may be of some importance. So it isn't necessarily just a binary question. My primary case is that there's no difference of treatment. The evidence doesn't bear that out. But even if that's wrong, and there's some, we're not talking homelessness, we're not talking 
uh, on any sensible reading of that uh, uh, research and analysis. We're not talking broad, uh, wide-ranging, and or significant effects. So for all of those, that, that's an aspect of uh, what I call the sort of about, about the bright line approach, where there will some inevitably casualties. That does not of itself. Yes. Take away justification. There are some difficult cases. It doesn't take away justification. You can cast it as bright line, if you will, or you cast it as being a a, a relative factor to the put fact into that the. There are casualties. Does not mean this seems exactly so. justification. That's your point. Yeah. comes back to the point I made earlier, which is it cannot be the case that the scheme can't be justified if there is any risk of the private individual acting contrary to law. <coughs> so that's justification. Um, I've got uh, declaration of incompatibility is the next topic. Now I can take that very, very shortly. We've dealt with it well, in our scope. You've, uh, you've covered it in your opening. I've covered it's it pretty much in my opening. opening yes. I, I have. There are two key points. Um, we've dealt with it in our skeleton at 49 to 53. The first point is that it's not appropriate or indeed even permissible to make a Section 4 declaration unless the legislation itself is incompatible. And it will not be unless all or nearly all of the cases falling within its operation will breach. Christian Institute and all of that. That plainly isn't the case. No one has suggested that the evidence reaches that height. So if that's the right test, that's the end of it. And it's to be noted that the judge's approach on this is that any scheme of this kind would be unjustifiably discriminatory. You couldn't rectify it. I think, again, I think we've discussed that before the short adjournment. But the second point is that it's not appropriate anyway if the problem identified could be fixed without changes to the primary. It's a, it's a bit of an aspect of the same thing, but a slightly different angle, perhaps. So if the fault, and again, we discussed it briefly, I think I discussed it with Lord Justice Higginbottom, if the, if the fault lies at a particular level of the scheme, here, if the fault is that landlords are tempted into acting unlawfully by document provision from prospective tenants that is capable of being fixed by, I don't know, producing more specific, I can't see how it could be done, but more specific secondary legislation or more guidance in the codes or more engagement, then that's the answer. It isn't a Section 4 declaration that flows. And in any event, we've made, we've made a series of, of um, uh, uh, points about even if declaration of incompatibility were to be appropriate, you don't over-declare. And for the reasons set out in para 53 of the skeleton, even if you get to that stage, there's been over-declaration because some of the provisions in the Act are, have nothing whatever to do with the discrimination problems that the judge found. But I don't take up time on those, they dealt with in writing. Declaration of irrationality is the penultimate topic, and equally short. This was the declaration that any rolling out of the scheme into Scotland and Northern Ireland, I think, would, be, would necessarily be irrational. The evidence on the intention of the government is dealt with in Mr. Asmat's statement at paragraph 79 and following. Um, I make two submissions. The first is that it's premature to get into this question in any event because it relates to the possible extension of the scheme to Scotland, Wales and uh, uh, Northern Ireland. And secondly, that it's pointless to do so because any decision of that kind about rollout would inevitably need to and would take into account the final judgments in this litigation, apart from anything else. But if this court were to uphold the decision on other, in, in the other respects of Mr Justice Martin Spencer, are you saying that the government would still propose to carry on and roll out in Scotland and Northern Ireland? Well, that's precisely my point. I, I can't see any sensible base on which they would do so. If that were the so are you saying a declaration is simply unnecessary? Yeah, pointless. But you, you would accept it would be quite wrong to go well, ahead. It would, it would depend entirely on the reasoning of the court, but it's highly unlikely that if they... Well, I'm just saying, I must say, if we adopted the yes. reasoning of Justice Martin Spencer... <coughs> well, then the scheme is unlawful. Right. And they, so, so, they, would, so, they would not... They would so, not so it would be irrational to go ahead elsewhere? Yes. But you're simply <coughs> saying 
So you're not saying it don't correct, you're just saying it's simply not, not needed, is not, it? Not, as far as you're going? Not needed and, not, uh, and, and pointless. You're not reserving some kind of right to bash ahead in Scotland all the same, are you? I'm not reserving my right to bash ahead in Scotland if this court decides that the scheme is unlawful on those grounds. Of course not. You might find yourself in trouble with me if you do that. <laughs> I'm not quite. <laughs> yeah. Which is, is why I'm not banging you, that right. So your main point is it just isn't it's necessary. Not necessary. It'll follow from... Uh, it'll follow from if, this. If Mr Justice Spencer is right, it in effect would follow. If Mr Justice Spencer is right, it will follow. So if Mr Justice Spencer is part right and part wrong and you do it on okay. some other nuanced basis, then the basis on which you do it would need to be considered. That's all we say. That's really what it comes to then, isn't it? Yeah. So there's nothing of great significance in that. So far as costs are concerned, there is some complication around the precise form of order, but the suggestion that we make is that arguments about that should be left until the result is known. The, the judge attached a condition. For he the, did. Uh, is, there, is there authority that the High Court judge has power to do that, leaving aside a protective costs order? Well, uh, we haven't been able to find any, but... It, but, but and the Court of Appeals sometimes does it... Yes. Almost always by consent, but when sending a matter up to the Supreme Court. Mm. But has a High Court judge got power to impose such a condition? Well, my lord, we haven't been able to find one, but I, don't, I wasn't proposing to take well, up... Well, of course, it may be depending on the outcome of this case. So. Well, it, may, it, may, it may be a bit pointless, but it does lead to the slightly strange and unfair, it might be thought, result in any event, which is that if we win on everything, we still end up paying £30,000 net on costs in any event. And if we lose, they will no doubt say well, we have to pay their costs on some other basis. So, I mean, I'm, I'm not proposing to take up the court's time with that it's now. Love, because if the judge had refused permission to appear, and the court of appeal judge had granted permission to appear, you'd have been on that footing better off. Well, you would, depending upon the condition that was attached. So it's all it's an odd form of order. But I, as I say, I'm not, unless you want me to, I'm not going to make details. Well, just, just, like no one's saying you're stopped by the judge's... Condition. From claiming from costs, costs. No one's suggesting that. You, no. you clearly indicated from the outset you weren't accepting it. Exactly so. That's what, that's right. all so, we so, so what you say is leave it to... Leave it, it to them on, and we'll all have it, it The point may fall away if you fail on the appeal. The point will fall right. away. Right. And I should make it clear that, I mean, at the moment, it, it would remain perfectly open to uh, uh, the claimant to at least submit or argue uh, that there should be some form of cap in this court reflective of something that might otherwise have appeared had some other course have been followed. So I'm not going to be... No, not, no protective cost order was sought. No, uh, not here. In this court. Not here. But I don't want to... There's a... We'll wait and see. Yes. Uh, I respect for some the better course unless you want to do something else. Are those your submissions? Those are, my lords, unless I can assist further. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, yes, Ms. Carter. As I indicated earlier, um, I am, I suspect, going to take your lordships to quite a lot of uh, the relevant case law in, in some more detail than uh, Sir James did. Um, can I just indicate at the outset the direction in which I intend to travel? So, that would be helpful. So, as a starting point, can I make it clear? We accept, as the judge did, uh, that this was a scheme which is not directed at all at the group which we say and the judge found as a matter of fact is discriminated against, the two groups. That is, those who are not British and those who are British but are... Uh, I've got a passport. No, no, no. Those who are British and who are... Who are entitled to remain. They're British, they're necessarily entitled to remain, but British, non-white, typically British, in the sense of having English names and so forth, i.e. it's discriminating against a group of individuals on racial grounds because um, they are black, they have foreign names, and so forth. So we totally accept the scheme is not intended to discriminate against them, it's not directed at them, it is intended to discriminate against a completely different group. We accept that the scheme's discrimination against that group pursues a legitimate purpose and is intended to pursue a legitimate purpose and is, so far as the scheme works, the least intrusive means of doing so 
under that scheme. There's, there's not an alternative means within such a scheme of doing so. So accept all of that. But as the judge found, the scheme is, as a matter of fact, actually causing discrimination against foreign nationals who are entitled to be here and entitled to rent and against British citizens who are entitled to rent because they're black or because they're Asian and are unable to show with a passport that they are British citizens. So it's having that very, very serious effect. And that was, a very, that was a starting point for the judge. The judge started from the premise that racial discrimination is something which is abhorrent. And he found, as a matter of fact, that this scheme, although unintended to do so, is having precisely yes, that effect. Yes, one could pretty well, pretty well work out from paragraph one of his judgment what the conclusion was going to be. Yes. Yes, but, 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 but he's starting from a premise where this is a scheme that didn't intend to do it, Measures were taken to try and prevent that, but despite those measures being taken, it has had that effect. So and can I just be clear on this? Yeah. Is your case then dependent upon the evidential position which you advance? Uh, there's no question it's dependent upon so the evidential So you're not saying that by its terms, taken on its own, the legislative scheme is in any sense discriminatory, directly or indirectly? Absolutely not. You accept that? Absolutely not. Well, the legislation on its scheme is discriminatory, but not against this particular class. No, but yes. it's discriminatory in the sense we, that... As accept. I said at the outset, I accept it does not direct itself to this group of individuals. It does not require landlords to discriminate against this group of individuals. This group of individuals are people who are entirely outside the reach of the scheme. They should not, if the scheme is working properly, be subject to the scheme's effects. But what is happening in practice is they are effectively being treated in the same way as those to whom the scheme is intended to apply. Not to the same extent, but the de facto effect of the way in which the scheme creates an economic incentive on landlords to avoid applying it, and I'll explain that in a moment, means that... In the end, they take the safe course, which is to prefer British citizens, because they know they're safe with British citizens, because they fall outside the right to rent aspect of the scheme. And therefore, if somebody has a passport and is a British citizen, that is the safest thing for them to, to look at and the safest person to offer a tenancy to. If somebody is a British citizen but doesn't have a passport, they will go for the next best thing. That's when they apply a proxy. And that's when they try to satisfy themselves, absent a passport, that somebody is nonetheless a British citizen. Because they know if it is a British citizen, they simply cannot, there cannot be any risk that they are going to be subject to the civil or criminal sanctions that apply under the scheme. Because those civil and criminal sanctions only apply insofar as the individual to whom they have let the tenancy is somebody in relation to whom you have to establish a right to rent. But there is no risk if you let to anyone who has one of the specified documents. But there is a risk insofar as those specified documents may be a forgery. Well, the British so passport may be a forgery. If one looks at the documents, one looks at the documents that one that are on the lists and, and judges those as against a British passport, there is a wealth of difference between the ease of forging a document such as a letter from uh, 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 somebody of standing as opposed to as opposed to a British passport. So they are very, very different documents. And individuals who have to establish a right to rent because they are not British citizens they will need to produce any one or two of a long list of documents. 
And in that long list of documents are many documents that could be forged. But a, but a landlord's not at risk if he in good faith acts on the basis of a forged document. Yes, that may well be right. But a landlord is not going to sit and look at the situation and think, well, if I act in good faith on the basis of this document, whether it's forged or not, I am OK. He's going to look at this document and say, well, what happens if it turns out it's forged? The safer thing for me to do is simply not to get myself into having to be concerned about any of those issues, I will simply let to a British citizen, because I know in that situation I am totally outside of the scheme. Oh, you should just that... work on the footing that no British passport would have been forged. I I'm sorry? Just work on the footing that no British passport would have been forged. Even if a British passport is forged, well, yes, working on the footing that no British passport is forged. Are, are you but, saying... but, it, but even if a British passport... Are you saying this is a rational response by the landlord who's going to do this? It's absolutely a rational response by the landlord. A rational response? It's a rational response by a landlord. A landlord is, is provided with a scheme which places them at a prospect of civil liability subject to them being able to excuse themselves and being required to pay the fine and then excuse themselves in the event that they let to somebody who it turns out hasn't got a right to rent, at potential criminal li liability, if they do the same, subject to showing a reasonable excuse. Those are serious, serious potential prejudices. The landlord isn't going to sit there and, concern, uh, uh, and determine, well, if I've done this in good faith, I'm going to be free of any sort of risk. The landlord is, what, is going to take the view I want to minimise my risk. I also want to let as quickly as possible my premises. So there are two strong incentives. One, to minimise the risk that they are going to be subject to the scheme, in, subject to any possible penalty for having been mistaken, whether in good faith or not. And secondly, they're going to want to let their property as quickly as possible. And those are two ways in which the scheme incentivises them to sidestep the requirements, the right to rent requirements entirely, by letting to British citizens. That is, in our submission, and as the judge found, unquestionably a rational response. As an economic agent, as it is a rational response to the scheme. Now, I understand... Although, it, although it's unlawful. I understand. The scheme, nonetheless, points up, well, quite separately from the scheme, it is unlawful to do that. And the scheme itself requires a code of conduct to be written, which tells landlords again and gives them specific guidance on the illegality. But the incentive nonetheless remains. An economic incentive unquestionably remains. The question for the landlord then is, if it looks at that incentive, it has to measure that incentive against, if the landlord does this at all, and I, I will show your Lordship's ways in which the scheme itself, um, or, or the code of guidance, uh, it is such that a landlord may not even concern themselves about whether or not they're committing an illegality because the code of conduct permits them for economic reasons effectively to take this course. Um, we'll come to that. But where a landlord, who is an economic agent, seeking to maximise his profit and minimise the risks of his economic activity or her economic activity to, him, to herself, considers... What course of action to take? Of course, if that agent is considering everything, they will look at the fact that this is unlawful with the consequence that there could then be further implications for them if they conduct themselves in such so a way. So does it follow, well, that follow on your argument that, I know you don't have them, but the Residential Landlords Association would be justified in issuing advice to its member landlords only take on people who have British passports? No, that wouldn't be, and that would be because the Resident Landlord Association would be instructing its members to discriminate. Now, all of that, so it can't act unlawfully like that. Of course not. But secondly, conduct like that on the part of the Resident Landlord Association is relevant to justification. So if, if we take this in stages, firstly, is the scheme itself causing landlords to do this because of the incentives that are built into it, despite the illegality, despite the way in which the code is uh, 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 directing landlords to that illegality and stating in terms landlords <coughs> should not engage in illegal conduct. But if, as a matter of fact, 
and the judge so found and was entitled to, it is causing that discrimination. If, then the next question is, is the state responsible for that discrimination? Does the state, and by is the state responsible, what that really means is, does the state have to justify it under the convention? Uh, and, and I will take your lordships to why, in our submission, it does. Is the discrimination within the ambit? Let's assume we've got all the way there, and all those boxes are ticked, and the judge was correct. Then the question comes down to justification. Now, in so far as um, landlords are contributing to that discrimination, as opposed to uh, 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 sorry, not landlords, the RLA or any other res uh, landlord association or any other body is contributing that discrimination by directing landlords to engage in that illegal conduct, that will obviously have a bearing upon whether the scheme is justified um, and whether the state has justified the scheme. And certainly there will be measures that the state can take to, to stop landlords so, so engaging, which is also another relevant consideration. Secondly, if landlords are directing... Uh, sorry, if the resident landlord association or other organisations are directing landlords, say, to engage, that also would be a matter relevant to the question of causation. It didn't happen in this case. Landlords haven't advised any... Sorry, associations have not advised landlords to act in that way. I'm, I'm not surprised. But, no. Uh, um, but of course. But... It, but, 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 but thought they would advise them to act in accordance with the law. No, exactly. exactly. Yes. <laughs> Which would suggest to me that's the rational and right approach. It, 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 it's, it is the legal approach. We don't always... It, it, it is not necessarily the rational approach to take the legal approach. If you're looking at this from the perspective of a landlord as an economic agent who's, who's that's a... That's a strong thing to say to a judge, but anyway, maybe you're, maybe you're right. You're right, it's quite tempting. Nice. Well, we only have to look at what's happened in practice. And you have, to, you, you have to have an explanation and an understanding in terms of what the landlord might rationally do before you can conclude. Just because a, a landlord thinks it's more convenient and economically beneficial to him to break the law uh, doesn't mean, does it, that it's rational. You say, that is rational. Well, the, the, the landlord is going to reason his way to that conclusion. He's going to ask himself, how am I going to act now? My, my aim is to maximise profit. How am I best going to do that? My other aim is to be a landlord and not put myself in a situation where I might become criminally liable for things that I've done. You've always got to do it, say to them, produce, produce the documents on the specified list. And forgeries are not going to concern him. It's always, it's always got to say is, it doesn't have to be a password, it's got to, got to be one of the specified documents. Yes, and there, is, there are and two is, consequences. Is that, is that so very difficult? There are two consequences of producing the documents. So he doesn't just have to look at those documents, he has to satisfy himself those documents are genuine documents. And he knows, or she knows, that in that context, if that person turns out not to have a right to rent, it may be that criminal proceedings will be started against that individual with all the costs that that entails um, because... He has, in fact, led to somebody who had transpired did not have a right to rent. And this was a point made by, by my Lord, Lord Justice Henderson earlier. It's not just the, the, the tenant who's going to sign the tenancy agreement. It's all the other adults that live in the property. There are a whole series of documents. You have to check the genuineness of all of those. So it's not in and of itself a small measure. There is in administrative inconvenience. But that's not what alone, and far from it, creates the rationality of a decision to try and sidestep the scheme altogether. So in doing it's that, a landlord will then run the opposite risk of uh, being potentially sued to discrimination in the county court by saying to us, I'm not tithing you, you haven't got a British passport. Well, he's never going to say that. As our, as our right so, to... So he rationally will say, I'm not going to run the risk of criminal offence, but he, 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 he'll take on the risk of being sued in the county court. Well, let's look at what the risk is. So... As our, as our mystery shopping exercise... Sorry to shoot all these questions you missed off. No, no, no. But, uh, they, they, they're, 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 I'm very happy to answer it. be one of the nubs of the case. Yeah, and I'm very happy to answer it. So we have, uh, in our mystery shopping exercises, mirrored how these approaches are made to landlords. Yeah. And so you have an approach, 
And then what happens, and what has been the basis for evidencing the discrimination, which has obviously, as we'll see, been analysed and found to be statistically significant, is not that a landlord says, and of course they're not going to do it, and they never would, I'm not going to let to you because you haven't got the documents, they simply don't contact the individual concerned. They don't get back to them. Now, it is simply impossible to go to a county court and prove a case of discrimination on the basis that a landlord simply didn't get back to you. And that landlord didn't get back to me, that landlord didn't get back to me, that landlord didn't get back to me. You're not going to be able to show that that was because of discrimination. It's extremely difficult to bring a case in the county court by which you can establish that you have been discriminated against. That's even assuming, that's even assuming a tenant is going to, a prospective tenant is going to take those steps. Now a landlord, is faced with two possible legal consequences as a result of this scheme. One is the possibility of a criminal and civil sanction, and the other is the possibility <coughs> of a discrimination claim at which will only arise should a tenant decide that they're going to take that course of action. Now, they are not <coughs> equal risks by any stretch of the imagination. And Mr Justice Spencer found, as, uh, and we submit, as he was entitled to on the evidence, that the Equality Act, the fact that this conduct is outlawed, coupled with the specific focus on landlords, on that illegality by way of the code, did not prevent landlords nonetheless discriminating. So whatever we might say as to how a rational landlord would behave in the face of a legal obligation, rational landlords have not behaved in that way. They haven't done so. And in, our, in my submission, it is perfectly rational for them not so to do so. Suppose, just giving a, a rather extreme and not real world example, suppose the Parliament introduced a legislation uh, that uh, all employers with more than five employees must pay all women employees who go on maternity leave up to three years pay for absent maternity leave. With all the bells and whistles we have in this legislation about you mustn't discriminate, in the real world, the argument was just as small employers are going to say, I'm not going to employ a young woman. Yeah. I'm just not going to. Mm. It's just economically irrational. Mm. I simply cannot afford to have... So, are you going to say that sort of legislation would be I, struck down as incompatible? I would submit that that sort of legislation would be such that the state would be responsible for it because, as the judge found in this case, by direct analogy, let me take it in stages, responsible yeah. I'm saying at the moment, okay? Yeah. So that discrimination, not employing any women to avoid three years of maternity pay, that discrimination is such that it has been the result and only the result of the scheme. The scheme caused it, but for the scheme it would never have happened. So put aside the fact that there are a lot of sexist men out there, this was not the result of their sexism. It wasn't that the scheme gave them an opportunity to do it, it's that the scheme has caused them to do it. And the state is responsible for that, and I'll take your lordships to why. The question then is, and forget ambit, it's obviously within the ambit, the next question then is, is it justified? Yeah, well, then it'd be justified, yes. yes. Yeah. Now, the state has up its sleeve one very good thing. It's trying to remedy discrimination by the very measure it has passed. Absolutely. That's the sort of step case. But, but and the, instead, the point is, though, you, you say this. In the example I've given you, it would be incompatible unless justification could unless be shown. justified and, and then justification and then is justified good exactly itself. now now if in fact three quarters of women found themselves outside the field of employment as a consequence of this measure then it's very unlikely that the state would have to justify i mean something so extreme in my submission would require the state to have to carry out an evaluation to see what kind of impact it's had. And undoubtedly, there would be an enormous amount of evidence that would be put before the court from three quarters of the female population saying, I used to have a job and now I haven't. Um, and I'm not, I, you know, I haven't even got pregnant yet, I'm only 22. So yes, the state would have to justify it and it might have difficulty depending upon the extremity. Now our case is no different and that's what I'm going to show your lordship. Well, that, well that's logically consistent, yes. yes. 
So, and, and can I just before I start, we will come to this again, make it clear what the judge did find on causation. He found at paragraph 105 of his judgment that the scheme is causing landlords to discriminate. So one of five of his judgment is at page 89. In my judgment, the answer to this issue lies in the findings I've already made in relation to causation. This is to answer a point that was put to Sir James earlier on um, as to what he found in respect to causation. The co what, what did he find the scheme was actually doing? What effect was it having? It is my view that the scheme introduced by the government does not merely provide the occasion or opportunity for private landlords to discriminate, <coughs> but causes them to do so where otherwise they would not. So it's not, this is an opportunity case like those sexist employers who don't like women. It is exactly like the situation where it is the measure of requiring employers to give three years maternity leave that is leading to the discrimination. That is causing. But for that measure, it would never have happened. Which isn't to say that some landlords aren't still discriminating because they're racist. But he's focusing not on them, he's focusing on a different group whose discrimination arises solely because of the skin. So, can I start then by looking at his findings of fact in relation to whether discrimination is being caused, whether discrimination is arising, and if so, what is the cause? So, the material that was before the judge was plenty, and it was on the basis of all that material that the judge made his findings. We can go back to his judgment. Paragraph 96, page 86. In conclusion, I was struck by the consistency of the evidence from the various different sources, including JCWI, Shelter, Crisis, the RLA, the report by the Independent Chief Inspector of Borders of Immigration, and so forth. <coughs> so all of that evidence. And elsewhere, 93. In my judgment, the evidence when taken together strongly showed not only that the landlords are discriminating against potential tenants on grounds of nationality and ethnicity, but also they are doing so because of the scheme. And he says, and he makes it clear, that it is not... I'm sorry, I've now lost the relevant paragraph that he would not have made that finding on the basis of any one bit of evidence, but he makes the finding on the basis of the totality of the evidence. And it's 93. Second sentence of 93. Yes, in my judgment, the evidence when taken together strongly showed not only that landlords are discriminating against potential tenants on grounds of nationality and ethnicity, but also they are doing so because of the scheme. While any individual piece of evidence would not, by itself, be sufficient to lead to this conclusion, the evidence as a whole, when taken together, powerfully suggests, sorry, shows that this is the result. In my judgment, there is a consistency through the surveys and arising from the mystery shopper exercises that this is happening and the causal link between the scheme was not only asserted by the landlords, but is a, and this is where we have the word logical consequence of the scheme for reasons convincingly submitted in particular by Mr. Bates. Let's do away with the word logical consequence. It is rational for landlords to act in that way because, in fact, the scheme creates an incentive for them to do so. And that's how we put it. It incentivizes them so to do. So can I look at... Sorry, may I just interpret the point that he's... I'm finding worrying about all this. I mean, I quite understand your point about the economic incentives and the landlord's wish not to have void periods and all the rest of it. If it weren't for the effect of the legislation taken as a whole, one could easily comprehend all that, and that would be both rational 
one sensible to act accordingly. But does it not rather beg the question to treat your landlord as though he or she is an economic agent and nothing else? Inevitably, a landlord is a citizen of this country with an obligation to obey the law and to find out what the law is in the case where it's not certain or he, knows, he or she knows there are regulations about it. It's not enough just to know in general terms that there is a requirement. If you want to know about the existence of the law, you have to inform yourself. I mean, that's just one of the facts that being a citizen requires one to take on board. So how does that fit into your analysis? Because they don't cease to be rational because they haven't done that. They don't cease to be acting rationally. They just haven't done something that is, in the court's view, something they should do as a citizen. It is nonetheless... So they, rationally, they could look at the whole scheme, they could inform themselves about the legal requirements, and they can weigh the risks that they face if they comply with those legal requirements, or they don't. And they can still rationally conclude that actually it is better for me, I face less risk to myself, both economically, but also in terms of um, being a, 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 a court for any actual or non-actual breach of the law, or for my attempts to comply with the law, but my failure to do so. It is better for me to sidestep this scheme altogether. And it's not irrational for them to having taken full cognizance of what their legal requirements are, to say, nonetheless, I'm not going to comply with them because I'm very unlikely to be caught if I don't. And there are these, these strong, strong incentives for me not to comply. So why does that leave the rule of law? No, exactly. Uh, why does that leave the rule of law? This is undermining the will of parliament. This is, this is, this is, this is uh, in effect, saying one should encourage uh, disobedience to the rule of law. One's not in any sense saying you should disencourage you should, you should encourage disobedience to the rule of law. What one is asking here is, what is, is a measure justified where the state has created within that measure incentives that landlords have acted upon, even though it's done whatever it can to stop them from acting in the way that those incentives um, incentivize them to do, to do is the scheme justified in circumstances where that is the case? If they've tried to do everything that they can, but nonetheless, and despite that, they have continued to act in accordance with the incentives built into the scheme, and the result has been racial discrimination. But, but the Act is not given any incentives to break the law at all. On the contrary, the Act is geared, and the Code is geared to stopping infringement of the law. But you, you, you simply, no. you know, because it's created created onerous obligations on landlords, which it undoubtedly has. <coughs> Therefore, landlords are justified and will be expected simply not to do what they're required to do. I haven't for a moment said landlords are justified. Landlords are acting unlawfully when they do this. They're not justified at all. Of course they're not justified. That's why we're here. They're doing something that is highly unlawful and is seriously prejudicing individuals who, have, who are British citizens on racial grounds. Of course they're not justified. The question is... Should the state account for their activity in circumstances where it is the very scheme they have created that is incentivising them to act in this way? But are you accepting that landlords are also causing the uh, uh, unlawfulness? Well, there's no question landlords are causing it because it's, uh, it's their actions and only their actions in the sense of the immediate discrimination that is resulting in the discrimination for those of so individuals. Do you do accept they're causing unlawfulness? Yes, right, yeah. of course. But... You have to ask, why are they doing this? They are doing it because despite the fact that it's unlawful to do it, despite the fact <coughs> that the scheme sets it up and includes within it and requires the Secretary of State to produce a code to give effect to it, protections. They are still doing it despite those protections. And so the question is, if despite all those efforts, this scheme is nonetheless having this effect and it's racial discrimination, then should the state have to justify what is happening? And if it does have to justify it, was the judge entitled to find that it wasn't justified? Which is not for one moment to condone what landlords are doing. It is a totally different thing to say there is an explanation for why landlords act in the way that they do, because that explanation is relevant to understanding the de facto situation. It is an entirely different thing to then say what they're doing is justified and right. What they're doing is completely wrong. 
but it is understandable why they are doing it, given the nature of this scheme. And that is what Mr Justice Spencer found. He wasn't condoning the illegality. He wasn't ignoring the fact that the government is attempting to stop landlords behaving in this way. He was taking full account of that. <coughs> but he was putting himself in the position of a landlord and saying, from a landlord's point of view, it is readily understandable, not just understandable, it's almost inevitable that they're going to behave in this way. And in our submission, that was a perfectly reasonable conclusion for him to come to on the facts. It's not a moral judgment, and it's not a legal judgment. It is a question of what they're actually doing, and is there a ready explanation for why they're doing it? So let's look at the evidence that the judge had as to what they're actually doing. Yes, just before we do that, um, on your argument, could any scheme imposing restrictions on letting to persons not lawfully present in this country ever be sustainable? It would entirely depend upon the nature of the scheme. And but, but, but the, the logic of your argument seems to suggest you could never have a scheme of this kind that could work. I, I can't possibly say that at the moment because I, it's impossible to know exactly but, but what the scheme is. But any, any would be. scheme designed to have restrictions uh, on renting to persons with no lawful right to remain are bound to impose some kind of obligation on the landlord. Yes, it's, but it's, the, it's, the question then becomes, becomes one of is that obligation such that landlords are, as a matter of practice, acting in the way that they're acting here. Now, that depends upon the nature of the scheme. It's impossible to say right. in the abstract, right. because the discrimination in this case is not discrimination that you can judge by reference to the terms of the scheme. It's discrimination that is happening on the ground, in practice, as a result of the operation of the scheme. This is a... a, a, a factual question of how landlords are reacting to this scheme and why are they reacting to this scheme. This you're, you're scheme. On this I can't possibly say whether right. or not another scheme could be created that didn't contain the same incentives and the same risks. So what's the evidence that the, 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 the judge had? What I'm going to go through now is the evidence that the judge took into account. I'm just going to take you quickly through it because we, we, we have not much time. But um, and I'll give you the citations. And if you want me to take you to those citations, please tell me. But, page 184. Uh, core bundle or supplemental bundle? This is at page 184 of the supplemental, supplemental bundle. bundle. Yes. And this is, I'm going to take you through now, all the evidence from surveys. Surveys about what landlords say they are doing. Yep. And, and can I just make this point, because it's relevant to the government's own um, uh, evaluation. It's what landlords say they are doing because of the scheme. Specifically, what is this scheme leading them to do in terms of their letting practices? So, 184. And if we look at the very top, JCWI's report, Impact on Tenants and Landlords. This is their... 2015 report, yeah. September 2015, we can see that from the day before. So, 42% of landlords said that the right to rent requirements have made them less likely to consider someone who does not have a British passport. 27% are reluctant to engage uh, with those with foreign accents or name. 42%, 27%. Page 282, shelter. Page. 282. This is Shelter's report. Um, uh, 43%. Uh, I think I've got the wrong page here. Oh, sorry. 286. 286. I'm so sorry. 286. So, the table at the top, private landlords, do you think this law on checking tenants' immigration status will mean that you are more or less likely to consider letting to people who do not hold British passports, people who appear to be, I perceive to be, immigrants? And then we can say, see, 
less or much less likely, 43% and 44%. And although it's difficult with the shading, you can see with the key at the bottom, people who do not hold British passports is the less dense dark grey, 43%. 44% people who appear to be, I perceive to be immigrants, 44%. That's, again, specifically referable to the scheme. Then we get the JCWI February 2017 report. I, mean, I suspect, as a matter of statistics, you would have to set off, wouldn't you, the 4% of people who were much more likely, much or much more likely, to let to those people. There are a group of people who have responded to this survey saying... Are you saying they're much more likely? As a result of the scheme... Yes. Uh, they are more likely, or much more likely. Well, let's set that off then. 39% and and uh, 40%. That is still a very high percentage. No, no of course, yes. yes. SB 294, this is the second JCWI report. 294. Yep. Foreign nationals at the top of the page are being discriminated against. Over half of the landlord survey, 51%, stated they are now less likely to consider letting to foreign nationals from outside the EU. And then, uh, if we go to the next bullet point, landlords are also less willing to accept tenants who do not hold a British passport as a result of the scheme. 42% of landlords who responded to our survey stated they were less likely to rent to anyone who does not have a British passport. And that rose to almost half of landlords when they were explicitly asked to consider the new criminal sanction. That's relevant because um, we'll see that the, the, the shopping, mystery shopping exercise, which was conducted as part of this survey, was conducted after that criminal sanction was put into place, whereas the government's own evaluation was done before that criminal sanction was put into place. Next, the Resident Landlord Association survey, page 342. Page, are you now less likely to consider letting to any of the following groups as a result of the right to rent scheme? Those without British passports, 43%. Those with permission to stay in the UK for a limited period of time, 49%. Foreign nationals from outside the EU, EEA, 46%. The RLA 2018 survey... I should say there were 2,723 landlords surveyed there and 2,478 in the 2018 survey at page 403. And on page 403, we can see the graph at the top. Foreign nationals from outside the EEA, 52%. Those with permission to stay in the UK for a limited period of time, 53%. Those without a British passport, 44%. And then we also had, and this came in just before the hearing, before Mr Justice Spencer, um, a survey done um, at page 392. We have uh, the report on that survey provided by way of a letter from the defendant, page 392. So the letter came from the government legal department and it was informing us about a survey conducted by the Ministry for Housing, Communities and Local Government. 392. 391 is the, where the letter starts. I'm sorry, I don't know why I said 392. No. It is 391. So this is a survey done of 6,584 landlords. So it's a large survey. In answer to the question on page 12 of the survey document, this is under the heading, uh, under number one, on the third paragraph, fourth paragraph down, which, if any of the following types of tenants, are you not willing to let to? 25% of landlords who were asked selected non-UK passport holders in answer to that question. It represents 353,400 landlords who are registered with a tenancy deposit protection scheme once that survey is weighted. That's an enormous, enormous number of individuals. 25% of those said they will not let. Yes, the, the reasons being not willing to let were not explored. No. So in that, it's right to say the reasons weren't. But that has to be judged against. All yeah, the yeah, surveys yeah. where the reasons were explored, it is entirely consistent with those other surveys. 
And even if you work only on the basis of 25%, it is enormous. And even if you work on the basis of something slightly less than 25%, because some of those would discriminate anyway, it is very, very significant. Then we have the mystery shopping exercises. So that's the surveys. All of them consistent, all of them supportive. And that didn't stand alone. We then have the mystery shopping exercises. Um, so we then have the uh, mystery shopping exercises, and if we turn to the supplementary bundle at page 36, so we go all the way back, this was the first mystery shopping exercise, and, and, and you'll see at page 33 the different groups, it can be very confusing because there's um, so many names, so many different pairings. But if we turn to page 36, we can see the graph. Here is the hypothesis at the top. The prospective tenant who was not British, but had indefinite leave to remain in the UK, that's Ramesh, was more likely to receive a negative response or no response compared to a British citizen, that's Harinda. And then we can see at the bottom, if your lordships will read, the large effect size. So landlords more likely to choose someone with a British passport over someone with a home office document that proved that they had an indefinite right to rent. So that's the nationality discrimination. And I know there are criticisms about the fact that all that was said here was that there was a home office document, and I'll come to that later if I might. Can I come to the criticism later? Um, SB 38, oh sorry, uh, yeah. yes, sorry, yes, so now then turn to page 38, and we've got scenario 1 against scenario 2, so this is a two British citizens, one is white, one is BME, both have passports, and what we find, there's the hypothesis, no evidence of discrimination. And that's what we find if one looks at the bottom at the conclusion. So if they both have a British passport, there is no discrimination whatsoever. And this was repeated again in the second mystery shopping exercise for your Lordship's pen. That's at SB 77, and it produced the same result. Then we come to SB 78, the second mystery shopping exercise, because in the first exercise, this was not, although a difference was detected, it wasn't statistically significant. So the exercise was conducted again. That's the second mystery shopping exercise. So if your lordships would turn to page 77, you'll see that that second exercise report starts at page 72. And if you then see, we can see scenario one and two is redone. I'm sorry, no, not one and two. I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm 78. I'm sorry. I, I 78 is, pa is Paramount and Colin. So 78 is what we should be looking at. Yeah. So we're looking at... We have both white and BME British citizens who do not have passports. And this is, this is where we are looking at what is what are landlords looking for to try and satisfy themselves that somebody is British, where they don't have passports. The BME tenant faces racial discrimination. This is the hypothesis. Uh, the BME tenant will be more likely to receive negative responses or no responses than the white tenant. And that is exactly what was found if one looks at the conclusion. So this is where we are seeing proxies for Britishness. And that's where the race discrimination enters into the arena. And then we can see that the landlords actually rejected the vast majority of those who need permission to remain. And that's at page 3... Two, two. 
And these are the most vulnerable migrants. These are those who lack documents. These are those who are required, or landlords are required, to go through the Home Office document checking service. And, and, and it was asked before lunch who these individuals, who would be caught by this. And some of the most vulnerable individuals with right to remain are in fact caught by this. Victims of trafficking, people who, uh, who have a right to remain on human rights grounds, and you'll see the list there. And you'll see at the third bullet point, in relation to this group of individuals, of the 150... Sorry, which page? So, I'm so sorry, 322. 322. Of the 150 mystery shopping inquiries from a prospective tenant who asked landlords to conduct an online check, 85% received no response. Only 12% of inquiries received a response that might invite a follow-up, such as a phone call or a viewing. Only three responses explicitly stated that the landlord was willing to conduct a check through the landlord's checking service. This form of discrimination would also affect people whose documents are with the Home Office who have, or who have ongoing legal cases. So that very, very vulnerable group are the ones who are going to be worst affected <coughs> by this scheme because of the extra burden for checking that arises in their case. And it fits with incentives. This is going to take more on the part of landlords to ascertain the right of this particular individual to rent. In a landlord's market, why wait? <coughs> why do that? And perhaps this is a moment to take you to the code. 2014 code. And 182M of that code at the very bottom of the page, just above the little box, the code itself says if a person is not able to produce acceptable documents, a landlord should not assume that they're living in the UK illegally. Subject, that's 182M. Subject to business requirements, landlords should try to keep the offer of accommodation open in order to provide a prospective tenant the opportunity to produce documents that will demonstrate their right to rent, but they are not obliged to do so, subject to business requirements. So it is recognised by the scheme itself that there are business requirements, economic incentives that count against doing all these checks. So for this particular group, they are truly likely to find themselves in real difficulty in finding somewhere. And that feeds into the judge's findings about the nature and the extent and the impact <coughs> of this discrimination. Now, from all of that evidence, we invited his lordship to draw the following inferences. Landlords who said both before the commencement of the Act and afterwards, that as a result of the scheme, they were now less likely to let to non-UK EEA nationals are in fact favouring UK and EE nationals. Landlords are letting to those with UK passports because they prefer UK nationals, not just because they may prefer passports which was a point made by a defendant, as he then was, in the court below. And landlords are using ethnicity as a proxy for Britishness, rather than because they are inherently prejudiced against BME tenant applicants. And as we've seen in the event, the judge had no great difficulty in drawing his conclusion and making those inferences. And there's been criticism <coughs> of his having done so because, for example, there wasn't a comparison done 
as there was in the government's evaluation between an area that wasn't subject to the pilot. There wasn't, because there couldn't be. But it doesn't mean that because there wasn't, it is not permissible to infer that there was immigration, a, a discrimination. The question always is, is it rational and reasonable for him to have drawn the inference he did from the material before him? And the, on, the, the only evidence from which you can draw that conclusion is not comparator evidence. There's absolutely nothing wrong in principle with drawing evidence from surveys of this kind which ask a targeted question coupled with the mystery shopping exercises which are as close as you're going to get to what landlords are actually doing in practice because as far as they're concerned this is a genuine situation. That's the value of those exercises. So when one asks what inferences the judge was entitled to draw and how he should address the evidence. We need to look at what Strasbourg says about that and what our own courts have said about that. And in the Roma rights case, Lady Hale, and that case is at the authorities, tab 10, paragraph 73, sentence starting the explanation must. So this is the explanation for why there is a difference. The explanation must of course be unrelated to the race or sex of the complainant. If there is no or no satisfactory explanation it is legitimate to infer that the less favourable treatment was on racial grounds. So there's nothing wrong with inferring. We've seen the difference in treatment. So and which, we also. Which paragraph of Roma was it? I'm so sorry, it's paragraph 73. 73 on page, uh, yes, it's at page 55 between F and G. Yeah. Then the explanation must, of course, be unrelated to. And then in DH, we see how Strasbourg approaches this. This is tab AB63. Sorry, Authorities Bundle 63. And the relevant paragraphs are 178 uh, one, to 9 to start. <clears throat> As regards the question of what constitutes prima facie evidence capable of shifting the burden of proof onto the respondent state, the court stated in a chova that in proceedings before it, uh, there is, are no procedural barriers to the admissibility of evidence <coughs> of, or predetermined formulae for its assessment. The court adopts uh, the conclusions that are, in its view, supported by the free evaluation of all evidence, including such inferences as may flow from the facts and the parties' submissions. According to its established case law, proof may follow from the coexistence of sufficiently strong, clear and concordant inferences, or of similar unrebutted presumptions of fact. Moreover, the level of persuasion necessary for reaching a particular conclusion, and in this connection, the distribution of the burden of proof are intrinsically linked to the specificity of the facts, the nature of the allegation made, and the convention rights at stake. And if one then looks at paragraphs 186 to 189, its analysis of the evidence. So it starts by noting that, that applicants may have difficulty in proving discriminatory treatment. In order to guarantee those concerned the effective protection of their rights, less strict evidential rules should apply in cases of alleged indirect discrimination. And if your lordship will read down to 189. So, as far as they're concerned, 
statistical evidence alone is going to create a rebuttable presumption, and then it's for the government to explain and show that, in fact, the difference in treatment is not due to race or nationality. So as I started out on this section, we can see from the judge's findings that he looked at the totality of the evidence. He was quite clear that no one piece of evidence on its own would establish the discrimination, but that the totality, all of which was consistent, all of which pointed in the same direction, apart from the government's evaluation, so said the government, and we'll come to that in a second, all pointed to there being discrimination, it being race discrimination and nationality discrimination, and that it was caused by the scheme in the sense that landlords were reacting to the scheme and not acting upon their discriminatory uh, dispositions. And in our submission, he was perfectly entitled so to find on the flexible approach taken to proof and inference and in circumstances where there is simply no other explanation offered at all by the government to explain the discrimination measured and identified by the surveys and by the mystery shopping exercise. As I mentioned, he did reject the survey conducted by the government in 2015, and in our submissions, he was perfectly entitled so to do, for the reasons he himself gave. Firstly, the government's own survey did not even tackle the question of nationality discrimination, so even taken at its highest, it provides no answer to all the countervailing evidence that he relied upon to support the existence of such discrimination. Secondly, in relation to ethnicity discrimination, he preferred the conclusions drawn by the Joint Council for the Welfare of Immigrants Mystery Shopping Exercise, and he set out at 95 uh, why, I believe it's 95, why he did so. So at 95, he says, at page 86, in contrast, the government's own evaluation failed to consider discrimination on grounds of nationality at all, only on grounds of ethnicity. And as Ms. Kaufman submitted, so far as ethnicity, ethnicity <coughs> is concerned, it failed to ask the right questions. In her written submissions, she said, and if your lordships read that paragraph, So there was a very low level of response, and we can see at 23 of his judgment, there is more that he identifies by way of criticisms that we made of that survey. Sorry, paragraph. Uh, sorry, it's paragraph 20, 23 on page 59. Yeah. So, significant points about their pilot. And I'm going to take your lordships to some more, which were set out in the evidence before the judge. So firstly, the pilot was done before the rollout to the whole of England. <coughs> it was done, as I've noted before, before criminal sanctions were introduced. In contrast, uh, the uh, evaluation, the, the, the mystery shopping exercises done by JCWI were done after those criminal sanctions had been introduced. So it looked at the whole of the scheme, together with... 
Oh, oh, only the second one was after. I'm sorry, the second one was after. Um, it was too small in terms of the number of people uh, surveyed to produce statistically significant data. But in any event, and this is really important because it's been completely ignored by the government, it did actually show, despite not doing so to a statistically significant extent, discrimination based on ethnicity. So it was in the same direction. It wasn't that there was nothing. So it's entirely consistent. And then there are some further criticisms, as I said, that we made in a statement from Mr Patel of JCWI. That's in the supplementary bundle at pages 19 forward, paragraphs 55 to 69. And I would ask your lordships to read these. Not now, but I would ask that your lordships do so uh, in your own time because they provide very compelling criticisms. And I'm just going to touch on one. set out at paragraph 61 to 62 and it's the problem of aggregation so which particular paragraph have you wanted paragraph 61 to 62 which are the ones you want us to read oh okay. sorry 50, 55 to 69 55 to 69 I have looked at the same but I'll Focus more on Fifty five six nine. And which paragraph do you want to look at now? Sixty one to sixty two. If you'll read that now, because that really is a, a, a very significant and well founded criticism we submit. Yes, it's in SB tab A, pages uh, starts at page twenty one. Paragraph sixty one starts at page twenty one. Paragraph fifty five starts at page nineteen. The supplementary bundle. Sixty-two is what, in my submission, he refers to when he talks about failing to ask the right question. You can't get the relevant information out of these surveys if you aggregate the results. You have to target it specifically. Because race discrimination will only show up when it is being used as a proxy for Britishness. And they didn't ask that question at all. The JCWI survey did. So, uh, uh, as I <coughs> submit, uh, your Lordship should read all of that, but there was ample justification for Mr Justice Spencer to prefer the surveys which he did prefer and not to place weight upon the government's own evaluation carried out back in 2015. Can I, can I turn then to the criticisms that are made by the appellant, both largely in their skeleton argument, but a few canvassed this afternoon uh, orally. Firstly, every single one of those criticisms, bar two, which I'll touch on briefly, are canvassed in the judgment, were considered in full by the court, and were rejected by Mr Justice Spencer, with reasons. <coughs> and insofar as he didn't do so, he didn't identify reasons, but just rejected it. He doesn't have to, it's well established, deal with each and every point that is made. But in any event, 
he was perfectly entitled to reject each and every one of those criticisms and to continue to rely. So he dealt with, first of all, a criticism that landlords, the, the, this, the, the, the results may in fact all have been due to landlords preferring passports, um, which is something that they were doing already before the scheme. But there was evidence, and for your judge's notes, SB 98, and this relates to before the scheme, 40% of landlords looked for passports or photo identity documents. After the scheme, 80% did so. And again, every bit of evidence that the Secretary of State criticises doesn't stand alone. It stands together with all the other evidence that collectively the judge took into account. And I make this point, it's not necessary for every difference in treatment to be attributed to the scheme, but we know that 42% of landlords in the surveys, consistently 42% or so, were saying that it was because of the scheme that they were taking this course of conduct, i.e. the scheme had changed their behaviour, which is entirely inconsistent with explaining the results of the mystery shopping exercises on the basis that landlords prefer passports anyway and have done so before the scheme. And then there was the complaint in relation to the Harinda British individual with a passport paired with Ramesh, non-British, no passport. And there the criticism is Again, that it could be simply because landlords want a passport, and that's why that individual was discriminated against. And again, the answer is exactly the same. <coughs> you look at what landlords are say, saying that they are doing. You look at the fact that the scheme creates a rational incentive for them to do so. And you look at the fact that the ethnicity discrimination measured on the shopping, uh, on the mystery shopping exercises, is consistent with them preferring British passports and British citizens, i.e. it's not just preferring a passport. And the next criticism, it's unfair not, it was unfair to have carried out a test where one individual had a passport as compared with another individual who simply had a Home Office document. And what should have happened is that the British passport holder's case should have been compared with an individual who had a biometric residence permit, for example. And again, we submit this all falls to be judged in the totality. And then there is a complaint that the surveys did not say anything about ethnicity discrimination. Well, the, 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 uh, the appellant can't have it both ways. His evaluation said nothing about nationality discrimination, but he criticises the judge for not relying upon that. It's right that it didn't say anything about ethnicity discrimination. But what it did say is that they wanted to let to individuals who had a British passport. And the ethnicity discrimination arises as a result of that preference, because that becomes a proxy for Britishness. So the surveys, while not addressing it, <coughs> don't undermine it. They support the logic of why one finds ethnicity discrimination. Then the judge is criticised for relying upon anecdotal evidence. Nowhere does the judge give undue weight to anecdotal evidence. No, he, he seems to use it, in a sense, as a bolt-on. It's a bolt-on. Yes. There is anecdotal evidence that is consistent with everything that I find from all this evidence is occurring. 
Then there is a criticism of his reliance on the evidence of Mr. Patel and Mr. Smith. That is, their reliance, uh, th their evidence as to the incentives created by the scheme. And can I ask your lordships as well to, to, to read that evidence, both the evidence of Mr. Patel and the evidence, that, uh, and the Residence Landlords Association will no doubt take you through it, but I would ask you to read the evidence of Mr. Patel as well as to how he carefully explains the way in which the scheme does generate these incentives. Putting aside the illegality for the moment, just... I'll just keep my eye on the clock. Uh, Chris Carlton, uh, when would you like to rise? Half past four or before? At what I, stage are you? Are you nearly concluding this section of your I'm, argument? I, I'm relatively near to concluding this. If not, I'll just carry on with some final sweep-up bits tomorrow morning. But I'm very... Sweep, I am pretty near. Sweep-up tomorrow morning. Okay. everybody. Uh, is that convenient for everybody? If we say 10 o'clock tomorrow? The, the course list may say 10.30. Is that right with a few? Absolutely. Well, we'll start at 10 o'clock tomorrow, thank you very much. And you'd like us to read, uh, or, or reread as the case may be, Mr. Patel and Mr. Smith. Uh, I, I'd be very grateful if you could read the statement of Mr. Patel and Mr. Smith. Anything else you'd like us to read specifically for the purposes of tomorrow? We won't be giving an extemporary judgment, so don't worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> um... I don't think so. I, I think we'll have done the evidence and now we're going to go on to the law. Yeah, yeah. That's very good. Thank you. Thank you.